Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, BlessedHope2019.com. I don't believe that we're going to be here very much longer. I do believe that we are running out of time, and so I'm pressing forward. Just a personal note uh, before we begin, I've always believed in what I preach. Never knew the Christianity that most Christians I meet embrace. Never. That is what is so shocking, I think, about these videos to some people. I'm talking about a religious system that believes that we are under law, and it terrifies them to believe that we are not. Yet living as though they are not dead to the law through the body of Christ they actually live a life of constant fear, though they, they may be reluctant to admit that. The only difference between me and them is that I actually choose to believe what God has said in this book. We're both able to read. Our Bibles basically say the same thing, no matter what translation it is that we're using. The difference is that I believe what God has said and they do not. The majority do not. They, they believe what they've been taught. They believe what their pastor preaches. They believe what their family has taught them, what their friends believe. The difference is that I believe what God has said and they do not. And the text could not be more clear. Babes in Christ understand what I preach. Oh, believe me, they do. Many godly men of the past have also believed and preached what you hear me teach and preach and that is what makes verse by verse teaching so vitally important it is indispensable because by looking at the text verse by verse studying verse by verse that is what makes verse by verse teaching so incredibly enlightening because we gently step through verse after verse, accepting what the text says as divinely inspired fact. We don't argue with God. We don't say, well, that doesn't make much sense. In, in my human way of thinking, That surely that just can't be true. That places us outside the mainstream of Christianity. It places us in fact, at odds with most of what is preached, or that at some point we come to realize that the unpopularity which we endure, the rejection, the persecution, is the exact same as our Lord endured at the hands of a religious system that embraces law as a rule of life and therefore has no need of Christ. Go all the way back to Jesus Christ standing in front of, the, of the, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the Jews. They had no need for him at all. Law was their life. I'm telling you that is what is, is happening today. That's the age we live in. So those of you out there who have ears to hear will hear. You are hearing. I get emails confirming that fact. You know who you are. I encourage you to stand firm, to stand strong in God's love and grace for you, because we are not under law, but we are under grace. Now, we've been studying together in the Epistles to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 19 and 20 of the fifth chapter. And the fifth chapter is one of the key doctrinal passages in the Word of God. So we're going to continue on with this. You may find this video somewhat different in the sense that I may sound frustrated, I may sound angry. Believe me, I'm not. I'm far from angry. I've gotten past the stage of, of being confused. That's how many of my uh, 
my listeners who are coming into these truths for the first time as how they feel. They feel confused because they feel lied to. They feel betrayed by, by a, a Christian evangelical system that is not teaching the truth of this book. I've gotten, I got past that a long time ago. I have never, ever believed in anything other than what I preach. And folks, these are matters of life and death. This is not a game. We're not playing a game. This is not a game that we're playing here. It's not for, for weekend keyboard warriors out there to, to throw gr the words grace around, in other words, around salvation, grace, throw these words around, toss these terms around when they have no biblical basis to support the presuppositions that they that they put forth. So let's have a word of prayer and we're going to go on with the text here. Father, I, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, not my own. And in the Holy Spirit, just thankful, grateful for the opportunity that you've given us to come together and fellowship and feast upon your word. I ask that you would just take and, and strip away all foolishness, all error, but seal to the heart, our hearts, seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's Christ in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Beginning in chapter 6 which we're about to get into. We're going to study more and more the results of our redemption. That's where, we, that's where we've come to. Whereas up until the end of the fifth chapter, we've looked at God's provision in redemption. God's provision as far as our redemption is concerned. The focus has been on redemption, not salvation. These are two different, entirely different terms, even though sometimes they're used interchangeably. Man was totally depraved. The creation we've seen fell in Adam. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, death passed upon all men, even though some had not sinned after the same manner in which Adam sinned. This is what we've learned. The subject of law is now introduced in the fifth chapter. So we've come to the fact of the, or the principle of law as it's being presented in, and we're being taught concerning the subject of law in the fifth chapter. The text has shown us that the law was temporary for many, many Christians today. In fact, more than not, in my opinion, are unwilling to recognize that the law was temporary. It had a beginning at Mount Sinai and it was taken away at Christ. The law was added we read in Galatians chapter 3, because of transgression, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, so it was added. If it was added, it could be taken away. And the same chapter says, the law was until the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. So it was added at Mount Sinai, and it was subtracted at Christ. It was not destroyed. Don't write me, please. Don't write me saying, Steve, why, did, why are you saying that the law, God did away with the law? He didn't. It was not destroyed, but it was fulfilled. Fulfilled. Big difference. However, we find the principle of sin is not dependent upon law. It is unbelievable to read commentary after commentary that you, you can't have sin without law, and that's not true. Sin is anything that is contrary to the character of God, the, holy, the holiness, the righteousness of God. Transgression goes beyond the limit, so we need law for transgression. That's why the law was added. We got up to the 19th verse, verse 19, and we found a wonderful illustration of grace. It is important that you realize as, as you enter the 19th verse that Adam's sin 
was imputed to every man, every person, for by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all sinned, and the imputation of Adam's sin is one of the great debates of Christianity down through the years. Pelagius was one who, who began, uh, he was one of the earliest ones who began teaching that it was not imputed to every man, that when you were born as a little baby, well, you're just like Adam was. There's no such thing as total depravity and imputed sin, according to Pelagius. And those theories have been branded as heresy down through the years by conservative Bible students. But they are the dominant theme in modern Christianity. If the decision of new birth is up to you, then Adam's sin was not imputed to the race and you are not totally depraved. You cannot possibly support such a thesis from this book. People simply ignore what God says. How are you saved? By accepting Christ. No doubt about it. But how do you accept Christ? You accept Christ by being born again by God, not you. Salvation is not redemption. Only redeemed people can accept Christ. It is absolutely mandatory, Christ said. He, he used the Greek word, the Greek must of necessity. It is absolutely mandatory that one be born from above or he can't believe. And Christ emphasized that in the 10th chapter of John. Why do you not believe my words? That's what he said. Why do you not believe my words? Because you're not my sheep. And folks, only an idiot would say, that verse doesn't say that you have to be a sheep in order to believe. And yet I tell you that modern Christianity in the majority teaches, you know it does, that you'll become a sheep by believing. When this book teaches, you believe because you're a sheep. That's what this book teaches. That's what it says. That's what it says. Now we reach the 19th verse. The 19th verse. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That's it. For Pelagius or, or Arminius or anyone else today to argue that, that they are not sinners until they sin themselves, that there is, there is no imputed sin from Adam, and that man is not totally depraved, is anti-biblical, folks. It is another gospel where the scriptures declare, let him be accursed, and yet it is modern evangelism. I read articles that, that there's a great separation between evangelicals and liberals, and I say, you got to be kidding. I don't know. I don't know who an evangelical is anymore. Evangelical, historically, is one conservative individual who believes in total depravity, the sovereignty of God, eternal election, perseverance of the saints. That used to be an evangelical, no longer. I've met very few in my lifetime. There were, there were a great number of them in the 19th century, fewer in the 20th century. And today, true evangelicals are, as, ex, are extremely rare. It's by the, the one man's disobedience that they were made sinners. Nobody, can, nobody could sin unless they're a sinner. Somehow, somehow we, we have the idea that you become a sinner by sinning. No, no, no. You sin because you're a sinner. You steal because you're a thief. You kill because you're a murderer. Those are simply intuitively obvious precepts. And Adam's sin was imputed to the human race. He's the federal head of the race. His sin was imputed to the race. You had no choice in that. And in exactly the same way, by the obedience of the one, Christ, the elect, shall be made righteous. 
There was no choice in, in the first half of the verse. There's no choice in the last half of the verse. And as I pointed out in our last study, though people tremble to think about it, the verse says it doesn't matter how you live, you will be made righteous. That's what it says. I don't care if you don't like it that or not. I don't care if you argue with that or not. I don't care if that upsets you or not. I'll take your accusations. Your accusations, which, which is, it's always the same. Steve, you can live however you want. Are you kidding me? I can't believe that you said that. Folks, it doesn't matter how you live. You will be made righteous. You have been made righteous. It wasn't, it wasn't because you did anything. That is what the text says. Now, you can believe it or you cannot. Your choice. There is no possibility that anybody in this world, true to the word of God, could put synergism in that 19th verse. There is no human cooperation. You are made sinners by the decree of God. The imputed unrighteousness of Adam's fall. And you were made righteous. The imputed righteousness based upon the obedience of Christ, not yours. Not based upon what you believe. Or how you live. And that, dearly beloved, is grace. Oh, Steve, you sound so angry. So much. You know what? I have put up with this. I have. I've endured this suffering for going on 34 years. Well, it, well, all the rest, most of the rest of Christianity, with the exception of a few kindred spirits in my life, I have tolerated you putting my brothers and my sisters under law driving them away from Christ, not to him. Yeah, I'm a little ticked, okay? And I believe rightly so. And the word grace is bandied around as though people think that they know what it means. Look at the grace of God. It doesn't matter what you do because Christ was obedient. Stick with the context here. We're going to, later on, we're going to get into a personal responsibility as sons. But right now, we're looking at the text. We can't lie against the truth. It doesn't matter what you do because Christ was obedient. You will be made righteous. A fabulous precept of grace. Fabulous. Wonderful. Life-changing truth. Christians today are trying to change their lives, clean up the old man through law. When the truth is, is that this precept of grace alone is what changes your life. There's a tremendous argument today in modern Christianity. I could say who I think are, are, are leading these movements, spearheading these movements, one people call uh, lordship salvation. That, that is, if you're really saved, and they, and they use that word as though there's no distinction between deliverance and redemption or regeneration, birth. If that's really true in your life, then it'll show in the way you live. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't show in the way you live, then you're not made righteous. That's a lie. That's a lie. Ah, so, so the way that you live then does influence verse 19. How do you do that? How can anybody put the way you live and the way you perform in the 19th verse? Look at the 19th verse. Because of Christ's obedience, those whom he chose before the foundation of the world shall be made righteous. The promise is absolutely certain to all the seed. We read that in the fourth chapter. It's absolutely certain to all the seed. Not one, not one will be lost. And yet that group of people who call themselves evangelicals say that the way that you live determines whether or not you're really going to be made righteous. Another group, and they're the Reconstructionists, 
that actually the law was never fulfilled in Christ, so that it, it doesn't apply to you. It's quite obvious that the law applies to you. And so they build a whole precept on the fact that the law is the basis of your redemption, keeping the law, which is absolutely impossible. Nobody in Israel did it. What leads you to believe that you could do it? Our verse says that sin was imputed to us from Adam and righteousness is, is imputed to us from Christ. And it is in totality, separate from anything we do or anything we believe. Now, I'm not saying that it is not necessary to believe to be delivered. If you're going to be saved, if you're going to be saved, folks, from, from the fear of death, if you're going to be delivered from the burden of sin, burden of it, if you're going to be delivered from the oppression of the law, and on and on it goes, if you want peace and rest and joy, then you must Believe in Jesus Christ. That's deliverance, but that is not redemption. God's elect are redeemed. And they now have the ability to believe. I don't know how many people I talk to. If you, if you don't believe, you go to hell. Is that so? What did God say to Moses? Because ye did not believe me, you will not enter the promised land. And all of a sudden, the promised land is heaven. And I, ha I have ministers tell me, there's a verse, see? Moses went to hell. You know, the promised land is heaven. Moses never got into heaven because he didn't believe. And I say, wow. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration a couple of thousand years later. How did he get on the Mount of Transfiguration? Nobody, not one of you listening to me here can show that Moses went to hell. But he didn't enter the promised land. He wasn't delivered from the wilderness. Neither will you be if you don't believe. But he was redeemed. He was redeemed. It didn't matter whether the firstborn son in Egypt believed or didn't believe he was delivered. If his dad did something, and if your heavenly father applied the blood for you, you're redeemed. And if you don't know that, you can't know what God means by peace. Therefore, having been declared righteous, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll never know that peace. You will never know that peace until you understand the absolute sovereignty of God and the completeness of the finished work of Christ. Moreover, the law entered. The law entered. The law came in alongside, is the word there for entered, came in alongside the sin in order that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That's the title of this video. I think sermon after sermon could be, and maybe this is why I've gone off the deep end here, super abounding grace and yet the entire religious establishment has wallows around in a pit of law keeping as a rule of life i think sermon after sermon could be preached on grace abounding personally i feel inadequate i've, I've said this before i feel inadequate to discuss god's grace to even Discuss it. We use the word gracious and grace, I believe, in very simple ways, in a, in a very simple, light way, compared to the way God uses it. When we were his enemies, when we were not seeking him, when we were not living for him, when we were opposed to him, when there was none righteous, no, not one, God redeemed us enemies, hostile to him, not serving him. He redeemed us. That's what the text says. Yet modern Christianity would have you believe that he, he redeems an individual because that individual seeks after God. He's not an enemy of God. He's trying to live for God. He wants to live for God. He's not opposed to God. He's got some little bit, some little spark you know, of goodness in him that causes him to be redeemed. 
Folks, that is a lie. He redeemed us because of his grace. Sin abounds. We could spend a lot of time just looking at that. Sin abounds. All you have to do is pass a law. Anybody, anybody recognizes the minute they hear a rule, a law, there's something in them that wants to break it. I mean, we could give a thousand illustrations on that. The first time a child is told he shouldn't do something is when he does it. Sin abounds. We are totally depraved people. In the flesh, there is nothing pleasing to God. You can't find one passage of Scripture that indicates anything good in the flesh, and yet modern Christianity is making a vain attempt to clean up the flesh. It's not what it's about, folks. It's not what it's about. It is totally depraved. Sin abounds. I think you'd see that on every side. You'd think, with what we know about the ravages of illicit operations, that, that we would have far outgrown that. Our TV, our, our entertainment media, newspapers, internet, social media, books, list goes on. Would all be beautifully clean and moral, you know, thesis, so that our young people would be raised in the nurture and admonition of a cultural society. you got to be kidding. You can go to darkest Africa and look at those natives and say, what these guys need is civilization. And then you go to New York City and you look at it and you say, no, 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 I don't think it's about being civilized. They need something else. Sin abounds. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. It would be amazing grace. It would, it would be infinite grace if God forgave your sin based upon the finished work of Christ. Uh, that would be unbelievable. That you didn't do anything. You, you didn't pay any price. Please don't miss in, in the 19th verse what is implicitly there. That God paid a price in Christ. It was ransom. We call it redemption. It was ransom. The payment of a price, and if you don't believe that that price was sufficient, you take that up with God. That would have been enough. That would make grace just super in anybody's mind. To think that the one sin of Adam may have made me totally depraved, but 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 think of, of the filth in my in my fleshly life. And if God had forgiven all of that, that that'd be great. Super abounding. But he did a lot more than that. He not only forgave all my past sins and every sin I would ever commit, he credited to my account the righteousness of Christ, an account so great, there's no way I could ever spend it up. But he did more than that. He placed me in his family. I'm a son of God. If God had just forgiven my sin and put me in a, in a, in a cabin someplace and in, in glory next to a clear blue stream with horses roaming across the landscape, you know, I'd be happy. But he did more than that. I'm a son of God. I'm in the family and the household of God. He not only forgave my sin, he made me righteous. He made me righteous. I didn't make me righteous. I didn't do that. I have absolutely no agreement at all with modern theology that suggests I have a part in my being made righteous. None. Trying to imagine where that leaves me. And you, if you believe if you're believing God. God has made me righteous and is is making me righteous experientially. Grace superabounded. We could read the verse that the offense abounded, but grace superabounded. And, or overabounded, or flooded over. Grace did much more abound. It's superabounded. Oh, the grace of God. He loves me. No matter what the difficulty, no matter what the pain, no matter what the situation, I know he loves me. And humanly speaking, it may be difficult to comprehend, 
Why, if I'm the child of a king, I've been placed in his family and his grace is super abounded, why should there be any problems at all? Why can't I just have everything I want? Why can't I live without one single health problem till, till I'm 130 years old and then just go to heaven? What I know is that my God has purpose in what he does. After you have suffered a while, he will establish, strengthen, and settle you. He suffered. The almighty, eternal God who spoke the worlds into existence, who hung the stars in the sky. When he became my kinsman redeemer, he suffered. He was hungry. He was despised. He was rejected. He was persecuted. He was crucified. Why can I not take the position of the disciples as we see in Acts? They rejoiced that they had been counted worthy to suffer persecution for his name. Grace superabounded. You know, we'd never know the superabounding of grace without suffering. The law entered that the offense might abound, but grace is more. Look at the 21st verse. Look at it. In order, as the sin reigned unto the death, even so might the grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by means of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Look at that verse. First of all, the word sin, hamartia, is articulated. It refers to the previous reference of the sin, which is that imputed from Adam. And as a result of that sin, death reigned. It's called the death. Our life with Christ ultimately results in an eternal fellowship with him. And the word eternal is something that we really don't understand. I mean, I hear it defined over and over again as ages without end. That's not true. Eternity is timelessness. God created time and time ceases when we are with him. The same with death. That imputed death, unless the price is paid, winds up in what is called the second death. And I pointed out in our present study that the first death was a death in Adam. The second death was a death in sin, which continues to what is called the second death in the book of Revelation, unless you're born again. And you're not born again by anything you did. Accepted, believed, received, repented, baptized, or anything else. You're born again by the will of God. You're born from above by the will of God, not by your will. And once you are, once you're born again, you can accept, believe, receive, and so forth. But being born again is not the result of your will, but God's. As the sin reigned unto the death, which ultimately is the second death. What do you have to do to stop that reign? If you leave Christ out of the picture, how are you going to stop the reign of sin? Let's, let's be fair with the verse. How do you stop it? And believe me, much of what is called Christian is just such an effort. Obey the law. Not break the law. Be a good person. And on and on it goes. What are they trying to do? Break the reign of sin. And you have the entire word of God to show that that is a foolish and a wasted exercise. There's nothing you can do with the first half of the verse. We have exactly the same situation we had in verse 19. What can you do with the last half of the verse? Even so, the grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The same concept that was in verse 19, shall be made righteous unto eternal life. Why is it that most of modern Christians do not believe that they can do anything to stop the first half of the verse, but they have everything to do with the last half of the verse? Is grace going to, let, going to reign if you let it? If you believe that, you don't understand the meaning of grace. Is grace going to rain if you decide that it's okay for it to rain? Or is it going to rain? 
Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Grace is going to reign. You don't have anything to do with it. You don't have anything to do with the righteousness of verse 19, and you don't have anything to do with the reign of grace in verse 21. It's going to reign. It's going to reign in the same way that death reigned. And surely, surely, the lesson for us is we didn't have anything to do with the fact that death reigned. No matter what we do, grace is going to reign. No matter what we do, that's the grace of God. Now, the argument always comes back, and I have to refer to this before I close. The argument always comes back, oh, Steve, so now, now, now you're preaching antinomianism. Nomos is the Greek word for law, and I'm preaching no law. I sure am. You are not under law. You are under grace. Do you not then have a responsibility to obey? Absolutely. Absolutely. God says, lie not one to another. I think he means that. If you want to lie one to another, I guess I'd wonder how much you love the Lord. Why would anybody want to do anything that someone that they love very dearly didn't want them to do? Of course I want to obey God. But I am not redeemed because I love him or obey him. I am redeemed because he loves me and he died in my place. That's the wonder of his grace. It's because I love him that I don't want to sin against him. And I have great reason to love him. And modern Christianity is so concerned, terrified in fact, that you may just go out and live a life of license that they put you under law, that is not scriptural. The law that you are under is clearly enumerated in the Word of God. It is the law of life, the principle of life, L-I-F-E. That's, that's the principle that you live under. Love itself is a characteristic of his life. It's the greatest of all, all, all the, the characteristics of the fruit of, of the Spirit but it is nevertheless a characteristic of his life, of the fruit of the Spirit. But how does one walk in the Spirit? It comes down to the principle of life. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Romans 8, 2. Love is contained within life. His life, not my own. Not mine. His. Love springs forth out of his life. Therefore, it is written that you love one another from a pure heart fervently. If you love someone, you want to live for them. You don't want to move against them. You don't want to move contrary to them. Life is the motive. The true motive for the Christian is the law of life. The principle of life in Christ Jesus. His life, not ours. The life that he has given us. And what a life that that is turned out to be, which leads to a righteousness that is based on faith, not law, faith in Him, that very thing which He desires the most from us, more than anything else, that we trust Him, trust in Him, and not ourselves. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, for, for me to scream it out. I love you. I love them too. I love all these precious souls who you've brought here to listen to this. Filter out all the garbage, seal to our hearts, only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.